So in ancient Egypt, they had this incredibly interesting tradition where they made these things called scent cones. And you see these when you see these on walls of say old Egyptian temples, they look like a cone on their head and they were made out of fat. And you know, they had this very stylized hairdos and the fat would melt during a party. Like you can see them kind of partying these ancient Egyptians and the fat would melt and the smell was in there and it would melt down through their hair and on their body. Or they would add oil to doves in ancient Greece and they would fly around and scent the air. People were very creative. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Hey, Randy. Hi, nice to meet you. Look at that display behind you. How beautiful is that? The little shelves for perfume are called a perfume organ. So that's oh. a... That's the perfume organ that's in the museum. And then I have one in my studio that's bigger. Pre-COVID, people could pick three scent strips, which you got of the things they wanted to take home with them. And they could smell everything on the organ. And they did. Yeah. And now they get six scent strips, but we dip them. They don't get to smell inside, but they do smell outside. Did you always know that you were interested in, in scents? Did you, like, how did it? Yeah, what's the story? How do you yeah. No, not my life is filled with like me, I'd say following my nose, but not really figuring a lot out, just okay. going toward what I like. I had a career for say 30 years as a psychologist for artists and writers, and I was in private practice. And I was very interested in what I did and liked it a lot. And I did a book called Story of Your Life, which was about narrative, because when you're a shrink, People tell you stories and you need to figure out if they're like a reliable narrator or what they are. So I got very interested in how stories are formed. So I wrote this book, Story of Your Life. And then I decided I knew so much now about narrative that I was going to write a novel. So right. I decided I'd make my main character a perfumer because I thought that was kind of a cool thing to be. I have, right. no, I have no idea why. So I started to do research. And I had written a book on Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones earlier in my career. And I like going to the source. So I went to all these old books from the turn of the century because I knew perfume was made from synthetics. And then I just kind of fell in love with the books and the eccentric people and the lore and all that. And then I took a little class and I thought, well, you know, this will be for my novel. I'll give research. Right. And I loved the materials. Like I just loved the materials and I had a knack for them. And I started to work with naturals in a, in a time when kind of no one did. This is like 30 years ago. I had a little business. I started with a friend who took the class with me and the business kind of had a bad end and I was back out of the business. So I went on and wrote a book called Essence and Alchemy. So it followed the steps of alchemy, which is really about transformation, but applied it to materials for perfume. And so I wrote that book and it was kind of groundbreaking when it came out. It sort of started people off on both artisanal perfumery and naturals. And from there, I sort of just, I don't know, just followed what, <laughs> followed what I was, I, I thought I was terrible at business. So I made my business completely personal Right. and it still is personal. I keep it as only up to what I can do by myself with myself and my husband. I don't, right. I don't want to grow. Right. I'm American. I have no interest in growing at all. I've turned yeah. away a lot of offers to grow. I love what I do. And then this museum was nuts. When I would travel, I would always love little, little funky museums about right. funky things more than the really big places. And somehow it occurred to me, I had a cottage behind my house. I could turn it into, I had enough stuff. And mm -hmm. then I really just loved it, which we can, we can move around and show you because my sure. husband's here and we can carry the computer around and show you all the stuff in here. We, we, we would, we would probably up. love that. Yeah, we would love that. Does he like perfume too? Has he, has it, uh, has it become interesting to him as well? He had a tech background. Our business is so idiosyncratic. Right. And he has such a genius for so many parts of it. Mm -hmm. And so small and hands-on, yes. We both love it, but it isn't perfume like Macy's, you know, right. it's not perfume. It's that the materials themselves connect you to really every culture in the world and really every age in the world. 
They're almost more universal than anything. They go all the way back to the Bible. They passed the Bible. They're in every culture's life. People are rubbing these things on themselves and they're connected to deep spiritual and social practices. So mm -hmm. when you're really dealing with these old materials, you have a kind of pipeline back to this very rich texture of life and you experience it. It's just, um, it's wonderful. I have a question for you because I'm thinking about your earlier life as a as a psychiatrist or a shrink or a therapist, what you were doing, and then thinking about how these smells really take you on that, they transform your emotional life. And so do you think there's a connection there? Do you think about that, how a scent, the scent of a woman, I'm thinking, but no, that's a cliche, but you know, different scents can transform how you feel, you know, and-, and without, that a doubt, without a doubt. I think that, you know, the whole world of aromatherapy is based on that. But more anecdotally, we have the happiest museum visitors on earth. People are really happy here. I have to say, I missed it so much during lockdown. They are just joyful. And I think that different materials speak to you in a different way. You know, and I noticed that with people. But some of it's wild. You know, it's funky. It's strange. Some of it's outstandingly beautiful. Some of it's kind of yin and yang. It's both beautiful and ugly at the same time. But I think it's the same experience people have when they cook or right. they garden, where they're really in touch with something that's timeless and beautiful in a way that's very rich. So I see people happy. And I think that I think of myself as kind of a drug pusher. And yeah. then people come and they're very happy when they leave. They just are. And at least half the people that come see us come back with other family members because they just want to share it. It's, I have no idea how I stumbled on such good fortune. What's the difference between artisanal and naturals? Like, cause you, you referenced both. So what's the difference between them? Artisanal means it's made with your own hands, it means mm -hmm. it's smaller scale. And so mm -hmm. up from artisanal is what's called niche in, in my field. And niche is really enormous. So artisanal means I make it all, like it's okay. made with my hands. Natural means I only use natural essences. I don't use any synthetics or anything from sort of biochemistry and stuff. Stuff I use all comes from plants and a little bit from animals. I don't have, so the materials I'm using have been in play for thousands and thousands of years and they're extraordinary. And that's what I work with. And in the world of commercial perfume, Almost everything, if not everything, is synthetic. And it's been that way for 100 years, no matter what people say. The right. marketing and the story for naturals is dynamic and desirable. But the reality of it being there is it's just not true. Because naturals are much more expensive, much harder to source, and more complicated. So they're, they're fit for artisanal work better. Give us some examples of what those are, the naturals. Like, what would they... What are they? And you said they come from plants and they come from animals. I've never heard that these come from animals. So I sent you two that come from animals. Do you, do you have yours? Yeah. I have mine. I have everything here. So I can go through. Did you want me to start with? I have two of the animals here. Yeah. I'm just curious about the animals because my dog stinks, to be honest with you. So uh. I think I sent you Choya, though. Did you? Choya. We have Choya. Choya comes from these shells. They're called the perculum mm. and, or ancha, and they're in the Bible. In the original recipe for incense that God gave to Moses, I believe, Moses or Abraham, I can't remember which one, it's called the Keteret, and they use this called ancha. So you can mash these up and they have a smell. So mm -hmm. it's these shells, I have all these shells here in the museum for people to touch and see. Mm -hmm. So when they're mashed up and then they're distilled in India, they're roasted. And that's what choya is. So if you smell your choya, which you guys have, they're roasted seashells. Mm. So they're funky. They smell like a campfire on the beach. They're smoky. Animal essences like this, that you can pick up the shells on the beach, transform other essences. They're a little bit like salt in cooking. They yeah. bring mm -hmm. everything out and make it smell amazing. The other thing you have is ambergris. I don't know which one of you has that. You, you got it, Jesse. But should I do a tasting note, like a wine tasting? <laughs> yeah. Tell everyone what it smells this like. This is a very large piece of ambergris. Oh, wow. 
And uh, this is my biggest piece. And I have an ambergris exhibit here with a whale, a six foot whale, which I can show you. Ambergris is whale poop, sperm whale poop. And it floats around on the <laughs> ocean and it changes and develops over time. And it is just gorgeous. Okay. It changes from poop. It's, it's the alchemy right. par excellence. It changes from this funky thing. It's special poop. Right. He comes out of the whale because he's eaten cuttlefish. Right. It upsets his stomach. It's in 1% of whales. And it's basically this very shimmering, ambery kind of gorgeous. It, it does not smell that animalic at all. It smells kind of ambery. You know, when I listen to a Muddy Waters record, I'm in Chicago. I hear everything about the room. Everything that was there at that right. time comes through, right? right. When I'm smelling that, am I smelling an earlier time? You know, what, what am I, like, what's the ambiance of that that it leads me back to? Because, you know, so much of perfumes of formulas are lost to history, yeah? So you you have to recreate them. So, or, or, you know, what am I smelling when I'm smelling this beyond the smell? Well, because you're smelling single materials, because perfumes were more of a commercial enterprise. So what you're smelling when you smell that ambergris I think is a real sense of the beauty of transformation, the oddness of human life, the idea that this stuff is picked up on the beach in many different places all over the world, and that it has the ability to transform what you've put together, what you yourself, when you've made a perfume, and there are many other artisanal perfumers now, it changes what you've made in a way to make it smell more glittery, more sparkly, kind of like salt in cooking, changes it, but doesn't really add a particular smell to it. It just makes everything smell better. And a lot of people like the warmth of it. There's a warmth and a reassuring smell to ambergris that people have really loved through the ages, but love now too. It's not just historical, it's also in the present. It's more of like an archetypal connection to deeper things right. that I think people feel. It's an ancient tradition. It was even medical, like in the past, they were more holistic in a way. If you read these old books, which I do, it begins as being kind of medicinal. And I think that's how they figured some of this stuff out. It was used in medicine. It was used in cuisine. It was used in spirituality. It was used in sexuality. People had this running through their lives, right. these materials, and they were precious. We are only now in the last hundred years out of touch with all of that. But would they put it on their body? So for example, yes. would you take a, a pure scent or you know essence or whatever we call the oil yes. and you would use it? Would men and women use it? Would children yes. use it? Yes, they would sometimes put it in a fat. So in ancient Egypt, they had this incredibly interesting tradition where they made these things called scent cones. And you see these when you see these on the walls of say old Egyptian temples, they look like a cone on their head and they were made out of fat. And you know, they had this very stylized hairdos and the fat would melt during a party. Like you can see them kind of partying these ancient Egyptians and the fat would melt and the smell was in there and it would melt down through their hair and on their body. Or they would add oil to doves in ancient Greece and they would fly around and scent the air. People were very creative. Oh, wow. But they also, you know, there was this wonderful old book in ancient India where the recipes for the food were filled with aromatics, filled, and they were very precise. So how do you go from something like this where you have the individual scent to, uh, say, pink lotus perfume? And how do you know you're making the original pink lotus? I'm not. All of my perfumes are original to me. So. Okay. I don't recreate, when I looked up actually, when I first started and was more insecure, I thought I have all these old formula, perfume formula books. And you know, if I don't have the talent or I'm not any good, I can just copy these old formulas was what I thought. And I made some of them and they were awful. You know, they had very interesting ideas, but they were very much the same, book to book to book. They right. would just repeat them. What they were great for was they had some interesting ideas, but they were scratching the surface of using the materials. They either made in the past these stock perfumes over and over and over again. 
which were okay, but not great. Or they tried to recreate a flower. Right. They, they had a lot of what they would call single flower essences. So to make a more personally meaningful perfume, which mine are, I make my perfumes around a feeling or a mood, and I'm very careful how I construct them. They didn't do that. They just passed them on and things like Apothecary sold them. So mine are more like a short story for me. So right. I have one about mourning. I right. have one about grieving when I lost someone. I have one about the, for, the air in the forest and forest bathing. So right. I have one. Mine are more a creation of a feeling in my life. And these are like my paints for that. I'd love to see the kind of what you start with. Your, you know, the paints that you or the scents that you start with. All of my perfumes, you know, I devised this way of creating a long time ago, and it's how I've stuck with. I create all my perfumes around a conversation between two essences. So I have a perfume called Sepia. I love the gold country here in Northern California. I like the gold rush towns. So I made it for the gold rush, that the perfume Sepia. And there were always those pictures with Sepia. And I built it around old rotting wood the old rotting wood and the sweetness. So it's kind of built around a fruit and a wood that I put together to make this smell that to me is about that period of time. And that's how I mostly create everything that I've made is around two essences and a feeling. Do you notice that a certain kind or a person is drawn to yeah. a particular, you know, in that narrative again, and that psychology again? Yes, I made a perfume that, when it first came out, it got horrible reviews and my feelings were really hurt. It was called Memento Mori. It was about grieving right. and it was about losing someone I loved that I was physically close to that was gone from my life. And I wanted it to smell like someone's body that you had been close, either sexually or not sexually, but that closeness you have when you smell someone. And so this was my farewell. And when I made it, you know, it, it was poorly received and it's gotten so popular, even yeah. with the bad review, people just love it. And I feel they get it. I feel there's a message in that bottle and right. people that get it will tell me it's kind of sad, but it really speaks to them and it's healing or helpful or something. And that was the message I, I put in it for me because they're all about my experience of life, but people catch it. And it's very thrilling to me. So yes, that's a, a very, a favorite of mine. And when people buy that one, you know, I always think, hmm, wonder what's going on there. Right. You know, do you make, like we have these little bottles you sent us, you mm -hmm. know, if I buy a scent from you, is this about the size it comes in? No, I'll show you because I have them here. I have the world's tiniest bottle See, here's okay. my nose. Right. These are my little minis. Right. They're very little. Now, how important is the bottle, Mandy? Oh, extremely important. Mm -hmm. mine, are, mine are very simple. But just like I think about the museum, I think you set up an experience for people. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to me that it's very beautiful in here. Beautiful mm -hmm. to my standards. That people see things in a way that makes you feel like it's sacred and it's meaningful. These are my solid perfume cases. They're sterling silver. Oh, wow. and I have these made, they open up. I have solid perfumes in them. And I also have antique wine. Explain one what a solid perfume is. I don't think Chelsea knows what that is. A solid perfume is one that's made in beeswax and jojoba oil. And it's very, oh. it's like a salve and people get those very fancy cases. And then mm -hmm. They send them back and I refill them. Oh, wow. So oh. Keep them for life and they're banged around and whatever. And then they mail them back. I also have this very cute, everything of mine is small. Mm -hmm. In fact, if people really want to buy a lot, I turn them away. Mm -hmm. So I keep everything small. This is a little pomander that I put together that where you can scent the felt balls, little dropper bottle, which you could wear. Mm -hmm. and there's these three little balls yeah. that I made up for, oops, people to use. Here's the third one. Out. How would you use the ball, Mandy? What do you use the ball to do? Well, this is if you don't want to wear it on your skin mm. or you want to just have it on your desk. It's felt. It'll hold the scent if you want to just fidget with it or, or bring it up to smell when you're nervous. Well, and during lockdown, people who got COVID, um, they had a lack of smell. And, and uh, 
that that could have really been a meaningful for a perfume collector that would be a really meaningful thing to lose no people got in touch with us who had lost their sense of smell and they would buy individual oils because i sell them and there's some little set that helps you with your sense of smell Mm -hmm. And people would like talk to us about that a lot or how could they revive their sense of smell. We would hear from them because everything's small and mm -hmm. all of our businesses repeat people. We, we respond to everybody who talks to us. Right. Things. So people did lose their sense of smell and bought and, and bought, the, bought specific oils for specific oils to kind of get their sense of smell back or try to and retrain their nose. Mandy, will you show us around a little bit around the museum? Yes. This is alphabetical, all these materials. I don't know if you can see how different colored they are. And then show the yeah. picture above. That, that I made perfume for Leonard Cohen for 20 years. Oh, wow. Um, the holidays were big time for me and him. Um, so here is just show the picture. It's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. It says, this is what we bring to science. This is my, I have many pictures of his. Yeah. It says, for the great alchemist, Mandy Eftal, with love and gratitude. And it's called the Muse of the Laboratory. So I have that for my organ. Nice. I, did, I was too terrified to meet him uh, for 20 years, but I did get my courage up right before he died. Yeah. And he was a fan. He, I had a perfume I made for him called Oud Luban. Mm -hmm. It was made with oud, which you guys have, which is yeah. the most expensive ingredient in the world. And yeah. Luban is a word for frankincense, which you also have. He liked essences that were from the Bible. Right. And he liked oil essences. And he loved Luban. He wore it every day. He kept it in the glove compartment of his car. Yeah. And was just a fan. And I, I never could um, bring myself to charge him for anything. Right. It made him incredibly upset. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't meet him. And so in the end, he sent me a lot of really very beautiful pieces of art. And I oh, brought nice. them out here. And it was a privilege and he loved the stuff. When he died, I fragranced his funerals, the Buddhist one and the Jewish one. It was, it was just an honor. So Oud Luban was his favorite. So was ancient resins, this body oil with a lot of ancient resins. Yeah. In it. So they were very special. So anyways, that's this. Which so Mandy, you're favorite? a big music fan as well, huh? I'm a very big music fan. Music informs my... In fact, I never make perfume that I don't have music blasting. <laughs> Now, Brian Jones is kind of an interesting uh, oh. choice within the band to, to write a book about, you know? Yeah, and I had no idea how I did that either. I mean, yeah. I like the perfume. <laughs> yeah. I love the music. I read yeah. this article about him where Keith Richards said something about Brian, and I kind of never really feel I'm going to get anywhere. I pursue things on my own. Mm -hmm. I don't have any grand expectations of anything really mm -hmm. and so i was interested in how he had such a terrible life when he had all these good things i was curious yeah and I I, these are days when you could just go to england for not much money and i did and i was i'm very thorough i'm thorough a researcher and i ended up going there and being accepted in the world of the rolling stones and mm -hmm. richards who was very very nice to me and yeah found all these people and I was fascinated with Brian's life and when I came back I ended up living in Joshua Tree with Donovan the singer okay. wife, with Brian who are still my good friends mm -hmm. I just followed his life I was curious about him yeah I wanted to kind of understand him better and it was fun yeah yeah well they're a great band is there more are there more to the to the room that we can see so this is, a, this is my paper mache musk deer. Oh, wow. So the musk deer is endangered. So I had this musk deer made. They had these teeth. Yeah. This is, ooh, this is $50,000 a kilo. This is the most expensive thing. Wow. So they're all different kinds of oud? They come from all over the world. These are two huge pieces of oud. Hmm. This is one of my absolute favorite books on the planet. It's called Symbolorum and Emblematum. And this is one of the earliest botanical books and they're, they're copper engravings and they uh, tell a story. That's from 1654. Everything's old. Wow. This is really the, you can see the materials. Like this is, mm. here is tolu balsam. Mm -hmm. And people can take it out and they can smell it with, through their masks, through their aroma cone. This is vetiver grass. I just think the raw 
raw materials themselves are extraordinarily beautiful. This is yeah. wood used in a lot of spiritual traditions in South America. Yeah. These are just them. This is spikenard root. It's very mm -hmm. famous from the Bible. It's like, yeah. I think it's like a shrunken head. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is the Ancha exhibit, which I showed you. Yeah. Old stash. Yeah. Gorgeous. It's so gorgeous. You know, Mandy, I we have that you sent us this cone, like aroma cone thing. I want to understand something about how to use it. And also, where does this meat meaty atar? What is that? Meaty atar is sandalwood co-distilled with dirt. There's a special dirt in India, and they co-distill it with sandalwood, and it smells like something called petrichor, which is what Earth smells like when it's dry and rain falls on it. It is exquisite. So of all the things you sent me, I'm the most drawn to this one. We invented these because in the beginning of when we came back to life after COVID, we had thought people would be able to smell in here and this would keep their nose off the bottle. And it's kind of fun and rich yeah. now through the top these little aroma cones and they amplify things. So everyone gets one of these. Wow. The wheel, I'm getting the wheel. Oh, well, I can't get it in focus. Is it in focus? Uh... Oh, wow. This is so cool to use. This we have at the organ and this I also use in my teaching. I made this and you guys have them. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be pretty and follow colors and like painting. Mm -hmm. It shows you the different families of smells. So you get a sense of the richness of what's available in the all natural world of aromas and people use these for blending um, people that are artis other artisanal perfumers and my students and people use them at the organ to help remember the names of things when they want to smell something right so for example for our audience under the florals you have champaca gardenia jasmine orange flower tuberose and you then you have the you have narcotic in there is it in, intoxicating? Like, what is the, who's defining these words? I mean, who's choosing these words? You. Now, and narcotic is a term for some heavy white florals, but they are narcotic. I mean, they yeah. over the head because a lot of these very narcotic floral have a molecule in them called indole. And indole is in the very fancy flowers, but it's also in poop. And <laughs> I don't mind too much here, but- yeah. <laughs> is in poop. And so there is a yin and yang. There's such metaphorical reference from all this. It's, it's how you fall in love with it all. With jasmine, when it's commercially made, it's often very beautiful, but doesn't have that poop that beautiful. Yeah, I have, the, I have it here, the jasmine. That's why I sent it. So when you smell real jasmine, you get the, the dark, yeah, the heavy, something else. Yeah. And what they do to each other, like in life, is so transformative. So the narcotic florals all have the little putrid piece. They yes. The absolutely gorgeous, knock you over the head, take you away, and a little bit of the putrid. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're all going to rethink poop after this podcast, <laughs> because we should. If we were eating naturally, we'd probably be having a different relationship as well, right, to poop. Would I mix like, okay, I want floral, rosy, journal, acetate, and I want some citrus, lemon, you know, lemon myrtle and, and mix them together? Would I use this wheel to mix my things? You could, you'd start there, but if I was teaching you, I'd make you just start with two and then think of where you were going next. So right. if you things you want to add, it's like cooking. Right. You can add a bunch of stuff, but once you have things into the dish, mm -hmm. have everything work with the stuff that's in it already. Do I mix two things and go, hmm, okay, that smells good, but now I'm gonna put in a little of this or a little of that. I did a cookbook called The Art of Flavor because I work a lot in flavor and food and I work with a chef, Daniel Patterson. Mm -hmm. We realized he made food like I make perfume. So right. he provides these four rules that he felt ran through all of his cooking, which was incredibly interesting. And it also runs through perfume. So if you have two, if you start out with two essences that are very similar, you need a contrast. Right. If you have two things that are very far apart, you need a bridge. Mm -hmm. If you have right. things that are very deep and heavy, you need something light to lift it. Mm -hmm. 
you have stuff that's very light, you need something heavy to ground it. So as I'm thinking, and once I've chosen my initial essences, then I'm thinking in those ways, what else is needed to get there? And usually a perfume is one completed aesthetic idea. Mm -hmm. As you're working, you work on that one idea, but then you take, you get other ideas and you apply those to the next thing you make or to revising what you've done. Right. Wow. Because of climate change, are you noticing that the essentials are changing and does that impact, you know, what you're doing? Are we, you know, are you vulnerable really to, I guess, to what's happening environmentally? Yes. Well, a lot of things like say sandalwood, which when I started 30 years ago was quite easy to get is endangered now. So there's a lot of issues around sustainability and endangerment and just everything about these materials. And they're, they're, they are harder to get. To. The ones I get from small farmers are very hard to get. Hmm. I'm going to just show you what's here. These are the 100-year-old books where I started from. Yeah. The books are divided into four sections. So these are perfume formula books, the one I was talking to you about, Jesse, and then and this group down here are these hodgepodgey, weird, holistic books of recipes for ink and perfume and soap. Yeah. This group down here has to do with food and drink and stuff because they use essential oils in that. And the one in the bottom is about plants. Wow. Most of them are 100 years old. And they're Wonderful. And everyone who comes to the museum gets a little kit and they get a white glove like Michael Jackson. Right. So they can touch all the books and they yeah. Let's go back this way. I'll show you the rest. This book here is the most famous herbal. It's huge. Mm. And these are woodcuts from that herbal. This is called mm. Catrum Botanicum, and it's from 1744. And then these are the botanicals hand colored from this book. You know, Mandy, when you said you put them all in your little back house, I thought this was going to be a small little museum. It's quite large. Yes, it's large. And then this is a hyrax here. This is a taxidermied hyrax. Mm -hmm. We call Mavis. This is Mavis here. Mm -hmm. And Mavis lives in colonies. Here's the pictures of Mavis. And they poop. This is another one. They mm -hmm. poop this gelatinous poop. And then people collect it. It's sustainable. People right. collect this poop and they use it in perfume and have for hundreds of years. They live in little colonies. Is sustainability an important issue in perfuming today? Yes, it is. It's very important. So these are all postcards of people gathering, but I'm going to show them the hand-tinted ones, okay? Okay. But these, I love these. These are very special. These are 100-year-old essential oil bottles that I mm. collected that still have the essential oil in them. And they oh, have wow. beaten tops, and they've aged. One of the exhibits I have outside is 100-year-old oils and modern oils. So you can compare how they've aged, like wine. Right. This is a civet, another animal ingredient here, and he's a taxidermic civet. And then this is more raw materials for people to touch, more resin. Mm. This is sweet grass right here, grated sweet grass. Right. This is a drawer here with poplar buds. Yeah. Here's yeah. A leaf. Amazing. And a poponax, which is a, a resin from the Bible. Yeah. And then this is my cabinet of curiosities. Mm. This is a pomander and people in the plague carried around pomanders and they were scented material that they wore All to right. run off the plague. And so this, this I call my Leonard Cohen pomander because it's got a <laughs> monkey playing the violin in it and he had mm -hmm. a line and first we take Manhattan. I'm sorry, I never got to share that with him. Yeah, but it's got opium poppies and a little ruby on the bottom. This was useful for smelling good things. So it had you put scented material in where the holes are, and then you could lift it up and carry it with you, like my modern pomander with the felt balls. Yeah. How do you clean your palate, your nose palate? All you need to do to clean your palate is inhale in a piece of wool three times. Mm. Wool. Okay. Your sweater, and when people come to the museum, we give them a little piece of wool. It, coffee beans, people think change your sense of smell, but they don't. But if you inhale in a piece of wool, your sense of smell will come back right away and then use the aroma comb. And then there's just little things in here like perfume buttons. These are old formula books here that I managed to collect. These are handwritten people's formulas from mm. the 1800s. 
And people made perfume at home. Just special stuff in here. Amazing. This is a, a book of secrets, which they had in 1595. And these were these hodgepodgey books of remedies. I mean, like, you know, take the left leg of a, you know, I don't know, badger and put it under your pillow and you'll have good dreams. I mean, they're very, <laughs> very wild. Yeah. This is our ambergris exhibit. And this is the whale. I got this from a whale carver on the East Coast whose family came over on the Mayflower and he makes little tiny whales. I found, mm. I love the teeth to have this. And then here are antique bottles of ambergris, which I have. And mm. then the little cathedral here, we call it the ambergris cathedral. Here are the little cuttlefish beaks to jump set mm. stomach. And these are different versions of ambergris depending on how long it stayed on the ocean. So oh, the wow. oldest, it's tossed around a lot. And these are just different pieces. And then this right here, where you walk in, these are our old hand tinted postcards. They're very beautiful. They're kind of a cross between a photograph and a painting. Yeah. Kind of show the lushness and the richness. So all of this is just kind of another world. Yeah, wonderful. Beautiful, incredible. Maybe we're so, so fantastic. And yeah. we're so, this is just beyond thrilling. I, I don't even, and I, I don't know. It just, it's been, it's incredible. And I think we're going to have to take a trip when it's time up to visit. Um, yeah. I think it would be amazing. I would love to send you like some of the little perfumes or the body oils. Is, is anything in particular appeal to you that the I forest for me you know i'd love to have the smell of the forest you know forest bathing. okay yeah i'll send you forest bathing and how about you priscilla i know i'm so excited about this sort of these well i'm i'm smelling right now the the fur oh the fur is beyond do you not have the fur jesse the fur? no see we split it up because we're not yeah. in the same place well, you should, guys, should, should. Yeah, we'll trade. Yeah, we will. We'll, we'll, trade. we'll bring them and we'll trade. Yeah. Ask you both anecdotally, do you find your mood is better from smelling yeah. that? Yeah. And hearing about this, I feel like this is this jewel in plain sight. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I feel like so lucky because I feel like I found all this and, mm -hmm. and I got to kind of do it my way, which yeah. is in a way that was really real for me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, share it with people. I mean, it just doesn't get any better. Yeah, right? yeah. So I've been just very lucky to kind of land here and have this great experience and have people like you be yeah. interested in my work. I'm very honored. Yeah. Oh, thank well, you. Thank, thank you, you, you so much. much.